Hello everyone. My name is Martin Bennett. I'm the adult services librarian at the Rita and Trotty Library in Lithonia, Georgia. Thank you for joining me for this Know Your News workshop. This is a workshop that was going to kick off a two-month program series on media literacy that we've had to postpone due to COVID-19. And hopefully we'll reschedule this sometime after the summer, but I wanted to go ahead and share this information with you today. You know, this program was going to be an introduction to the series. Each subsequent program was going to be was going to touch on a specific detail that we're only going to broadly talk and discuss today. So consider this kind of an orientation of um, more deep dives into media literacy. Um, the main goal was to understand how to engage with news stories by critically examining how we receive information in the news and how news stories are constructed. Many libraries are engaged in similar media literacy programs throughout the country because for libraries, our business is information. We play a role in ensuring that our community can receive and use accurate information and hold information accountable. Accurate information must be able to withstand scrutiny. In an environment dependent on accurate information, not just for political transparency, but for living and breathing as well, we need tactics for knowing what's accurate and what's not. Right now, as we you know, deal with self-isolation, quarantine, symptoms of COVID-19, as we're taking our steps towards preventing that spread, you know, it feels like it may feel like you're getting inundated with information and news stories, and it's it's hard to track what's accurate, what's not. So what I hope this workshop will do is it'll serve some relevance with that, plus you know the upcoming political camp um, elections that we will have this year. So that's what we're going to focus on today is you know sharing tactics on holding information accountable, particularly what so-called fake news. Now, before we get, begin, I want to elaborate on a few things. This program is not to going to chastise or dismiss the news or journalism. We're not here to say, don't believe everything. I like this quote from Addy Robertson of The Verge. You obviously don't want to believe everything you see or read, but uncritically disbelieving everything is just as bad. This program will not promote a political agenda. Fake news originates from liberal and conservative sources in equal measure, and we're going to show a couple of examples of in both sides. Newspapers with liberal and conservative editorial stances can provide fair journalism, and we'll show some examples as well. This is also a judgment-free program. For many of you, what we discuss is something you already do unconsciously, and what to do, how to engage with news sources may seem obvious to you. But many of us may see something and realize we've promoted commentary or news that wasn't factual. And, and it's okay if you've done that in the past. This is a judgment-free program. So before we begin, I want us to test ourselves a little bit. Information is not only provided by news sources, but by us. When we share a link or share a meme or image using our social media, we're basically acting as a news publisher for our friends and followers. So I wanted, during the presentation, we're going to have this slide presentation going, and I'm also going to be alternating with web links. That's why you see a bunch of tabs, and I, I must be honest, the, all these tabs make me uncomfortable. I like to have, have just a few tabs open, but these are all going to be helped us helpful to us. So we're going to look at news resources during this presentation, as well as the PowerPoint that you'll have. I'm going to refer to this New York Times quiz. What they've done is they've used images shared via pages on Facebook. For each question, one image was created by a, a sincere, genuine Facebook page, regardless of what you, you know, whether you disagree or agree with it, it was a sincere Facebook page. And one was created by a Facebook page as part of a foreign influence campaign. And so we're going to go down here. This is, a, this is an article called, Can You Spot This Deceptive Facebook Post Here? And it gives us a couple of these posts here. So we have one on here. 
This is a post that was shared on Facebook. And as you can see from the likes, it was liked. This was something that was shared by um, an individual that was identified as not part of a foreign influence campaign. And so was this one. And you see right here, more comments, a lot of shares, a lot of likes. So these individuals shared these posts. So they're acting as kind of a publisher for these stories. So the idea is you have to choose which one was part of a foreign influence campaign and shared by um, a real Facebook users and what was um, a, a real Facebook page, um, a meme shared by real Facebook users. So I'm just going to guess this one. Which one would you guess? So it looks like this was the influence campaign. This was the real page. Now, this was created by a fake account on Facebook called Resistors that was removed in July of 2018. Um, and it gives us information about how we could have guessed it was the real page. And it was basically the language. A lot of foreign influence campaigns, what they're doing is they're using language that's not quite grammatically correct. So you see right here, if you read the, read this, if, if it doesn't sound correct, or you know when you read it out loud to yourself, if it doesn't sound grammatically correct, then it could be part of a foreign influence campaign. Let's do one more. So this was a post shared about Latin American heritage. So based on, so we're going to look at each one, which one is it? So I'll just guess this one here. And it was wrong. This is actually part of a real page. This was the influence campaign. And they give us an explanation about why this post was a fake page. Um, and like these were Facebook pages by a foreign influence campaign, but it was shared by real users. They were acting as sort of publishers for their followers. And this was something that many people did over the past couple of years. And so just, I'll have a link to that quiz, but you can go to that quiz and test yourself and see how, how well you um, did with the quiz. What these Facebook posts reveal is a central tactic of misleading information and fake news, manipulating biases. One of the first tactics of holding information accountable is stepping back and thinking about your bias. You know, I, I like this other quote by Audie Robinson, good journalism provokes feelings, bad journalism exploits them. So they're basically, th those pages were there to kind of exploit your feelings. Um, you know, one of the pages was resistors, you know, versus feminist news. The other page was called Brown Power. They're there to kind of, I mean, exploit the feelings, the biases we may have based on our experiences, based on our um, background, and using those biases to sort of promote, you know, this information. We're also going to look at a couple of other examples here. I'm going to bring up this page right here. So this is from the Duffel blog here. Trump Tower opens in Pyongyang in North Korea. Now, just by that headline, that just sounds fishy. Trump Tower opens in Pyongyang. And this is the post here, you know, Trump Tower open in Pyongyang, breakthrough. So it's open up a hotel it's alleging that Trump is opening up a hotel in Pyongyang. Now, here's the thing. We can kind of probably guess that this is fake news, but this was shared as a real source on Facebook. And one of the ways we could have checked that, so this was shared by the Duffel blog, which was identified as America's most trusted site here. One of the things that I would do is if I'm not believing that something is real is I'll, I'll just go into Google and put in like the headline or I'll copy and paste a part of it to kind of see are other news outlets covering it. 
My feeling is if Trump Tower was open in Pyongyang, there would be a ton of news sources that would do that. I also might go to the actual source. So this was the Duffel um, uh, blog. And I'll look on the about page. A lot of these news sources are going to have about pages. If I look on the uh, our, sir, our story, I'm showing here that I've been serving since 1797. I'm showing here a blog reported on President John Adams' $200 per week cocaine habit in 1799. That just seems... That's not real. So, what that tells me is this is a satirical website. That, that article was satire and not real. But, like I said, that was an example of an article shared. I'll just briefly go over a couple of more here. Another, this is from Snopes here. This was, and, and you can also use Snopes. That's Snopes.com, where you can fact check specific things that are being, that are trending. Um, when, another thing that was trending, did protesters vandalize Brett Kavanaugh's house? Um, so a lot of websites were using an unrelated image to illustrate a story falsely claiming that the Supreme Court nominee's home had been vandalized. So both of that, that Trump Tower and Pyongyang, this story, they're appealing to different political biases. You know, the Trump Tower may be appealing to someone more liberal bias. This story appealing to someone more conservative or, or my, or my bias. But they're, they're using this sort of, these news stories that aren't quite real. And they're being shared by individuals because they're, you know, because of their biases. And they're being promoted. So that's all these examples get promoted and shared because they exploit those feelings. They confirm biases may have. So throughout the presentation, the formal presentation, we're going to be alternating with those links to kind of reinforce what we're going to talk about, how we receive the news. What's the difference between reporting and commentary? What are the components of an accountable news story? <clears throat> Sources, understanding how information is attributed, talking about fairness and bias, and, and I'll wrap up with some tips on actively engaging with reporting. So let's talk about just how we receive the news. So let's talk about news reporting. That's just the facts, a presentation of objective facts in, an, in a cohesive story. News reporters report. So they're going to seek the facts through multiple sources. Uh, court documents, like legal briefs, court filings, subpoenas, press releases, or interviews. A news reporter will write a story that manifests these facts in a cohesive, comprehensive, and clear story. A news story should tell you what you need to know using substantial sources as evidence. Typically, an editor will fact check these sources, and we'll talk about sources in a little bit. Now, that's different than commentary which is a contextualization of news reported from an individual based on credentials, political beliefs, beliefs or experience. So you'll see this often as, a, as an opinion, editorial, op-ed. Those are terms that are used by that. Basically, you know, my, this, is, this is what's not objective, and, and it's very different. Some people will see the news as commentary, but it, news, there's news reporting and there's commentary. And it's important to distinct, you know, commentary is going to be someone using their background to provide an opinion. Um, it's never going to be objective. It's also not always going to be bad. You know, a, an op-ed piece on the coronavirus may originate from an epidemiologist who's contextualizing what the reporting on the virus means and what their experience tells them. They're not being objective. They're drawing from their experience, but they're using they're using this news reporting to kind of provide their input. It's you know it's kind of like news reporting is like the play by play. Their commentary um, uh, is like is the color commentary you would see in a sports game. You know, normally for a common color commentator, you know, they'll get uh, you know a former athlete who could add their experience and add their um, uh, understanding of the game to you know help you the viewer understand what's going on. Now, we also have investigative reporting or journalism. So these are in-depth stories that originate from long-term research using multiple sources, often for public service. Um, you know, the, the picture 
on the right is from the spotlight team. So a lot of newspapers will employ a an investigative reporting team. At, you know, the Atlanta Journal Constitution has the watchdog. Um, Boston Globe had spotlight. So the spotlight team; these were the individuals who created in depth stories, doing you know um, you know a long long form research um, on the sexual abuse scandals in two thousand and two. So now here's the thing we need to understand about investigative reporting. It is reporting. It is going to use objective facts and language. It, it's not commentary. Um, you know, what you see on the, in the AJC on Sunday, that, Emma, that, that's reporting. They're building a story, but they're using objective facts to build that story. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of receiving the news is breaking news. This is where you get information wrong. I mean, this is where you get information of an event still happening. So that information can change. Not all the information is going to be correct during the moment. Um, you know, I think we're seeing that a lot now. You know, everything seems to be changing with um, uh, COVID-19 and the spread. So if you, you know, if you check the New York Times dot com, you're going to see just updates after updates after updates. And some of that information is going to be correct. Some of it's still going to be in the moment. And so it's, you know, just be be uh, cognizant of that reporters on the ground may get may share information based on a source that that's seemingly legitimate, but the information may be incorrect at no fault. To oh, one. There's a quote that you can use with looking at breaking news. Trust, but wait. So let's talk about the account, uh, components of an accountable news story. Um, so first one you always look for is the headline matches the story. So always look out for the headline. A headline that uses a hyperbole, exploitative language, or just doesn't really match the article is probably wise to question the reporting. A headline should be read as objective and neutral while accurately descriptive of the actual reporting and story. The second component of an accountable news story is a byline with contact info of reporter. Um, at the very least, just a byline. Now, now, for many online news sources, they'll um, have a byline with, um, say, a reporter's Twitter account linked or their um, email information. And, and that's important, as well as, you know, editor's contact information available. Usually, if you look in a newspaper, um, uh, you'll be able to find um, a, um, a, the, the, who the editor-in-chief is or who um, uh, the managing editor is. It's important that a news source have those available on their website. Um, because what's happening, it tells us that A, the reporter is putting their name and reputation on the line for the story reported. You know, there could be consequences if they put out a story um, um, and they don't they provide inaccurate information or they use, say, plagiarism. Um, you know, we've seen in the past, you know, where some, you know, substantial reporters end up getting fired because um, uh, they've plagiarized their stories. So a byline is telling us the reporter is putting their name and reputation on the line for the story reported. The editors have committed to fact checking of the story and a reporter sources. And they are accountable for incorrect information. So. Another thing that you want to look for is that an accountable news story should clearly state sources. Um, so let me show you a couple of things that you can do. So whenever you, what you can do is you can copy a section of the statement. So there should be a source in the story. You can check, you can copy that person's statement and paste it in a search engine. And you can also enclose that text in quotation marks to um, uh, search for the exact phrasing. The reason you're doing that is one, you're wanting to see if other outlets have reported on this. You know, if the president of the United States says we're broke, or says, um, uh, "Hey, look out! There's a UFO flying over." Well, if the president said that, then one, more than one news outlet's going to cover that, and two, we need to look out. We can use that quote. We need to find out what the context is. 
you know, a reporter should use that quote in context. If the reporter uses that quote without context, um, then um, uh, then obviously we have an issue. So one of the, you know, so, you know, we can always check sources. You know, a lot of online news articles are going to have links to some, uh, documents or sources cited. They'll describe the source, you know, um, uh, from a press release, um, this person said this. Um, they might also find legal filings through courtlistener. So courtlistener.com, this is a resource you can use. If someone refers to a court filing, like let's say um, in an article they say, um, the um, uh, in in this lawsuit, so and so said this. They're, they've probably got that from a court filing. You can actually check the court listener court listener here, and you can find specific um, um courts um, uh, cases that have been underway. You know, just just to kind of use a famous one here. You know, we all know about Brown versus Board of Education. If we type that in and search, we can actually fight, find court filings, and we can kind of use that to sort of, sort of check to make sure that what was filed is was is reported correctly, that it's sourced correctly. Um. So that's just an example of you know a way you can kind of take a look at that. That's why it's important that the sources are within context that they're that they're clearly stating what the sources are so that you can do that if they say that if they're referring to a court case and they, they need to say what the court case is so that you can actually go in and check that um i would also look make sure that there is multiple sources um, you know, if a source is, inc um, uh, is included information and it's not listed or not clarified why it's not listed, you know, that's a red flag. You know, I, I, you can't have a news story that's accurate with one source, you know, that could help amplify the story in relevance, like a big tip. A reporter will generally try to use um, uh, multiple sources to kind of prove the reporting as factual, however. So just be careful of that. And, you know, number five, Accountable news story is going to generally avoid hyperbole or exploitative language. And journalists pride themselves on their use of language. Um, any journalist has had experience with an editor, a rewrite person, or a professor who has marked over their article on their use of words and grammar. You know, if you have a chance, you can always, and I'll have this have these sources available, a lot of um, uh, news publications will have style guides. So you can actually look at like the Associated Press style using this Purdue OWL information so that you can see what the style, what they, what they ask for in style. Um, you can do the same thing. This is the Reuters Handbook of Journalism. So this is telling them how they are to report it. So like, you know, so for like cricket, like there is context for cricket and how how the cricket reporting should, what what it should include. You know, it needs to include a type of bullying. That's just for cricket. The sport that we don't really know about, but if they're reported on cricket, they have to be descriptive of that kind of information. You know, and this is a New York Times manual of style and usage. And this kind of talks about how do you describe things? How do you, you know, how you say things? So those are all available. So if it, so if you have a report that uses um, hyperbole or exploitive language, I think that would be a big red flag. No journalist and writer report on objective facts will use phrases like, you won't believe this, or we need to talk about the coronavirus problem as statements in the reporting. Any report that uses such language um, might be more commentary, it, um, uh, but it's certainly not reporting. Going back here, let's look at a couple of the languages here. So this is this is the New York Times conflicts over indigenously grown more violent in Central America. So that's a, that's a fairly neutral headline, and it kind of also 
you know, gives you the sub headline faced with government action. Some activists try to reclaim ancestral lands on their own. Often they pay a high price. So the New York Times, um, known as having a liberal bias, but this, you know, conflicts over indigenous land grow more violent in Central America. Now, when we go down here, we're going to see the byline here of these reporters. So if I click on that reporter here, it's going to tell me who this reporter is, what they typically cover. We can also, I'm just going to copy, and the reason I'm doing that, I'm going to go into another tab here, and, you know, I can find them on Twitter. So this is who this reporter is. That's all for an accountable news story, because if they get it wrong, then I could go on Twitter, you know, on the New York Times side, or I could actually go directly to that reporter. I could find out who that individual is. And then we look at the language here, you know, for decades, members of the Buran, and I'm mispronouncing that, I apologize, tribe in southern Costa Rica long to take back what they considered ancestral land from the farmers who also claimed it. One week and last month, they acted in rain several farms, hanging up signs and vowing to stay put. So that's that's fairly neutral language. It's not saying that one person's the bad guy, one person's the good guy. It's describing what's happening, describing what's happened. And then we get quotes here, you know, this local indigenous rights writer, I beg with you of all of my heart. I'm um, talking about, still has a voice recording of the call she made help. So we have multiple sources here. Same thing with the Washington Post here. Washington Post, jury and CIA leaks case fails to reach verdict on most serious charges. You know, descriptive headline, does the article match it here? So once again, we have reporters. So we've got it. We can email this reporter. We can follow them on Twitter. We can know who they are. This person has their profile image. A lot of reporters may do that, if, depending on their experience and you know where they are in that in news publication. Um, so, so this headline here is jury and CIA leaks my fails to reach verdict on most serious charges. So in this article here, a jury in New York failed to reach a verdict Monday on whether a former CIA employee gave an, um, uh, government hacking tools to WikiLeaks. So the headline's matching what's going on. Talking about the jury, like I said, the jury um, uh, in Leak's case fails to reach a verdict. Jurors who've begun to deliberations, they were extremely deadlocked. Um, so that's something that... Um, um, so this is some um, uh, all information that they've got sources. They've talked to individuals with. Um, they've got links to previous articles that have discussed this. So this is, you know, this is a you know what the jury is told to the New York Post. So they've got the story here that they've built for this. Now let's go to the Chicago Tribune. Now this is. Probably not something we... Are we not going to be able to use this? Nah! There we go. So, and I, you'll have to pardon the ads here. So, but, but the Chicago, Chicago Tribune, this is a re newspaper that is typ typified by more conservative bias. But even them, you know, p headlines, some patients of deceased Evergreen Park pediatrician like immunity to diseases for which they sought vaccination, Sheriff's Office says. So that tells us this is what this article is going to be about. So we can verify, is this what the article is about? And it also says Sheriff's Office says. So it says it's reporting on something that was disclosed by the Sheriff's Office. So we need to have some descriptive of that source or how they got that information. Um, they provide, I'm, uh, I'm going to right click and open this in a new tab here. So this is the reporter. I covered it so Twitter email so that way if it's not factual I can contact them and be like hey this is what you got wrong so it looks like the Cook County's sheriff's office is encouraging former patients so it, that's matching what the headlines telling us so it's telling us this link here so that's that's a former that's another article where they've already reported this So the sheriff's office said that. So 
we can what we could do is we could also we can so I'm showing here Cook County Sheriff's Office is encouraging former patients of deceased Evergreen Park pediatrician who's to um, uh, check their immunization status after some former patients learn they lacked immunity due to some all the diseases. So I can actually put in Google Cook County Sheriff Evergreen Park Doctor. So it gives um, uh, the Chicago Tribune. It also comes up with local patch article. So this was something someone helped. Um, um, Chicago sometimes. So this is this is all stuff that we're talked about in the Chicago papers. So this is all information that tells us. So this is not just covered by this. This is you know. So this was covered by multiple people, multiple sources. You know, this is patch right here. And so this reveals where the Cook County Sheriff is. So, you know, a person could contact the sheriff and verify that this is what they've said. So that's just all examples of how we can kind of take, you know, accountability. And Dallas Morning News, this is another article that's got more of a conservative bias. Same thing, so Collins County, Collin County reports first presumptive case of new coronavirus. Got these reporters here. We can click on links for them, find out information. Um, sometimes when information is updated, they'll have... So this was updated to include information on Dallas County's response. So that means... Um, uh, so typically a news source will update that if there are updates. So all of that just some examples of how to sort of verify an accountable news story. Those are all components. Now, let's talk about sources, because we were just sharing that here. You know, some of the sources were, you know, um, uh, Cook County Sheriff's Department, um, you know, for that, um, uh, for the Evergreen um, uh, Park pediatrician, um, talking to people who are in there, talking about what their experiences are. Let's talk about sources. So a source is anything or anyone that provides information. So reporters rely on sources for facts and input for news stories. So reporters may interview relevant witnesses or bystanders, subjects of a story and credentialed experts, such as professors, scholars, ex-officials. Um, they will also use documentation that is verifiable and traceable for information, like say court, you know, court documents. Um, so one of the big red flags I would look for for sources, their relevance. Um, if a source isn't relevant to the story within the context of the story, it's best to check out another outlet to verify, okay, are they saying the same thing? You know, reporting should use information that originates from a legitimate or relevant source. You know, a good use of sources, like let's say you're doing an art, uh, a reporter is reporting on something that originates from the Department of Justice. So a good use of sources on an article about the Department of Justice would be interviews with ex-FBI agents, uh, law enforcement, get an idea about kind of the procedure of how the Department of Justice works, um, ex-Department um, of Justice officials. Those are relevant sources. Those can provide information that are useful for people to, so people understand what's happening. Um, a bad use of sources for a Department of Justice article you know, your Uncle Bob, who works in mattress cells. Your Uncle Bob in mattress cells would be a great source for an article on mattress cells, but he's not a great source for um, reporting on Department of Justice protocol or procedures. Now, in a, a controversial topic, you know, we'll talk about anonymous sources here, because, you know, they're speaking terms that a journalist will use. On the record, which means whatever said can be reported with direct quotes, source quoted by name. So, you know, if someone does an interview with, say, um, uh, Governor Brian Kemp, you know, if Brian Kemp is on the record, then they can use his name and, and quote him as the source. Um, something's off the record, you know, whatever said only for context not to be reported. Um, so that, you know, if someone, you know, if you're inter talk, writing an article about the Department of Justice, you may talk to um, a news reporter may be talk to, talking to a 
Department of Justice official. They may have some things they're saying on the record. If a reporter's like confused about how something happens, um, the Department of Justice may say, well, off the record, you know, and just say some things that help that reporter understand what's happening. Um, on background means what is said can be summarized, but not with direct quotes. Um, and then deep background may not be quoted directly and may not be identified in any way. Um, this is controversial for many people because, you know, talking about an accountable news story, um, anonymous sources. A, some news reporting will use anonymous sources. Um, these are frequently deep background. Um, anonymous sources do not wish to be directly quoted, but will either confirm information or disclose information. So this is usually an anonymous source sharing information for their own biases, maybe for their own gain. Um, many share information because they feel it's right, they feel, but they fear retribution. They have a position um, that could be jeopardized. Their security could be jeopardized if they identify themselves, but they have this information they have to reveal. You know, an example of this in history was W. Mark Felt, who's on the right here. Um, he was a source on deep background who worked with Washington Post reporters Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward to disclose information about the Watergate scandal. He was a deputy FBI director, um, and he was disclosing this information to um, Woodward and Bernstein during that. Um, a, a more, you know, more recent example is this op-ed. So this is an opinion piece, commentary piece, written by Anonymous and part of the resistance. This was something the New York Times posted, and they had to disclose. We're taking a rare step of publishing an anonymous op-ed essay. Um, and they explained, we do this because the identity is known to us, but the job would be jeopardized by its disclosure. And they even did a separate additional article about how an anonymous op-ed came to be and where they answered questions. And, and several um, uh, people brought up, you know, this is anonymous you know, and they had to explain, why did you do this? Mo many times an anonymous source will seek out reporters. And, you know, a great question was, how do you vet a paste like this? And, you know, they explained, to, you know, how they did it. The New York Times had to do that because, you know, you can't just post an anonymous source. You need to have something to, you know, you have to explain why you're using this anonymous source and why we need to trust it without knowing who it is, why we should... Because otherwise, we're just being asked to trust it blind. It's something that it doesn't happen as often as we might think, but it does happen. Um, so documentation is a major component of sourcing. You know, reporters are going to use documentation as evidence to support their stories. So that document, you know, so for instance, when the Atlanta Journal Constitution went to court to have, they had to go to court to have federal subpoenas reveal for the federal investigation of Atlanta City Hall in relation to allegations of bribery on airport vendors. You know, that was a way that AJC had to get that court documents to be able to, um, 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 uh, to, be, able to be able to report on what's going on. Um, like I said, because of online articles, now we'll have places that will just hyperlink to, you know, those court filings. But, um, uh, you know, this documentation could, is going to include legal documents or court filings and like I said, you can use, verify using courtlistener.com. Um, you know, government documents can be retrieved um, through the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and like I said, many news agencies will go to court to sub uh, subpoena or reveal legal documents. Um, another, another way you can find, you know, another documentation that they'll use is just press releases. A lot of businesses and municipal governments, they'll go ahead and put out press releases for things that are happening. The reason they're doing that is to kind of have some kind of control on how the story is. So they'll go ahead and put out a press release about, you know, let's say um, uh, someone's fired or, um, uh, or they're um, uh, ending a um, uh, working relationship with someone or, you know, may just be even as, you know, just we hired someone new you know, that they'll put out a press release. Another thing they'll use is video surveillance or photographs. Um, these could be supplied by organizations or bystanders, um, maybe retrieved via FOIA or subpoena. So they'll find video surveillance um, 
and they'll find, or they might have like witness photography, you know, a lot of people are using their cell phone videos. So they may share that video with reporters who can, you know, use that for reporting, use that as documentation. Um, so just the, you know, so if I looked up the Cap County press releases, so most of these municipal governments will have a list of press releases. So this is a source of documentation. So the Atlanta Journal Constitution or you know other sources in Cap County like the Champion, um, um, uh, on common you know common ground, they might use this as sort of for the reporting. You know, the Cap County will release a pre press release. You know, these parks to temporarily close facilities. This is from the county, and so. Um, uh, another newspaper, another news source may use that information for reporting. Um, so you, those court documents, those are, you know, like I said, you can find those on court listener. Some, some of them can. Um, you know, you certainly can try to find that. Um, typically, if a document's, um, uh, if if reports are coming from a, originating from a court document, um, you can. You know, if they're using a quoted passage, you can copy and paste that quoted passage into Google like we've done with a couple of other passages. You know, a byproduct, just to kind of give you a laugh, a byproduct of this is Florida Man, the quote Florida Man. You know, so a lot of article, a lot of news sources, what they'll do is they've got this idea of Florida Man, like Florida Man caught feeding while alligator resist arrest. He's a good boy and he loves bagels. The reason those stories, they make it seem like and things are crazy in Florida. But here's the truth. Those th things happen everywhere. But they're, but Florida makes arrest reports more public than other states and other places. So it's easier for reporters to find these ridiculous examples. You know, what happens in Florida is no different. But because it's easier, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, news source might just go and look at arrest reports in Florida and they'll find something like this and they'll post it for, you know, some clicks, some laughs, etc. Now, let's talk about fairness and bias, because that's one of the big things that many people, you know, will chastise news sources for is fairness and bias. So, news reporting should be fair. That's that means legitimately sought, pursued, done, given. Um, so when reading for the news, look for clues for fairness. A newspaper or news service, you know, if it writes a big story on the U.S. State Department, they should seek comment from officials from this U.S. State Department. You know, and, you know, that what that's the way they can be fair is that, you know, if they're reporting on something that is about, um, uh, about someone or about an organization, they need to try to have, seek comment, seek comment they're sort of, you know, because that's the way to be fair. You know, they can't just say, well, the U.S. State Department did this bad thing. And, you know, because the U.S. State Department may have, you know, has their own experience with what happened. So they need to be co provide commentary or provide a statement that explains why they did that, because it may not be as bad as you might think. You know, so they may offer an official st release or statement. They may say no comment or decline to comment. But the reporter has to say what happened. So, you know, like this is an Atlanta Journal Constitution, Atlanta to make all landlords accept housing vouchers. So this is reporting on something the Atlanta Council is doing, um, uh, introduced by these reporters. Now, they interview supporters of this. It's an, you know, so they have these individuals quoted, but see, but when they tried to reach uh, Mayor um, uh, Mayor Bottoms, she had no immediate comment about her position on the passage of legislation. So that what that means is that that reporter they're publishing this article, you know, the, or the the news source is publishing this article. The reporter's written this article. They've they've talked to people, um, uh, supporters of this legislation. They've talked to different residents. Um, uh, and they've been quoted um, when they try to seek, but they've also tried to seek comment from the Atlanta Council, um, from the mayor, and she has no immediate comment. So that that was their attempt to find that. So that's a that was something they did out of fairness. They can't just post this without some kind of comment. Um, 
bias is a tendency to believe that some people, ideas, etc., are better than others, which often results in treating some people unfairly. Um, so, it, 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 you know, rep- you know, commentary is certainly something that will have bias, and certain newspapers may publish more kinds of commentary than others. But the reporting, as we've seen with conservative and liberal sources, you know, they are legitimately sought. They have the components of an accountable news story. They were pursued through, you know, appropriate documentation, appropriate, they're appropriately sourced. That's how we can kind of say that something's fairness. And, and even the most big name newspaper or big name news source can can sometimes, you know, maybe look a little unfair. Just, But that's the way you can kind of decide. Is this fair? Is this biased? These are some examples. Um... Like I said, fair reporting is going to provide legitimately sought sources, and they're also going to retract and accept responsibility when incorrect. That's something that's a big deal. If a news source um, uh, gets it wrong, then they have to publish an article the next day in the next newspaper in the next daily newspaper, or they have to change the online and say updated with this comment, updated with um, uh, or just say we got this wrong. Um. And you know, and even with due diligence, this could happen. A new story just doesn't get it right, and they'll retract it or they'll provide an update. Um, something to also look for is disclosures of conflicts of interest. Now, if we go to the AJC, we can, if we scroll, when you go to an, a news source, you can scroll down, and you can find out about the AJC and. You want to look for these things because it tells us who owns them. You know, about the AJC. So who owns the AJC? So this owned by Cox Enterprises. So if the Atlanta Journal-Constitution is, is writing an article that is about a company that's owned by Cox Enterprise, they have to disclose that. You know, full disclosure, you know, this place is of an investor in our parent company, Cox Media, or Cox Enterprises. They have to disclose that. Um, that way, they look. Um, uh, that way, you know. Okay, they're saying this, but they have somebody has a stake in this story. Um, so that's something you want to look for. Always look and see. Okay, who owns these art? Who owns these news sources? The example I have here on the on the right image is News of the World. This was their final newspaper. To kind of give you an example of, you know, the my news of the world ultimately lost advertisers because they weren't reporting fairly. Um, news of the world published stories on the royal family in the United Kingdom that originated from phone hacking, undertaking um, in, a, in, a, in a way that was connected to the company. So advertisers... Advertisers, of course, withdrew because they didn't want to be associated with this paper. Um, and there were, of course, legal ramifications for some of the individuals involved. So that newspaper ended up closing because they didn't report in a fair way. So talking about fairness and bias, everyone has biases. And, you know, this is these are some of the main ones. Um you know, explicit bias, which refers to the attitudes and beliefs that we consciously or deliberately hold and express about a person. But then we also have implicit bias, things that are less conscious. Um, they occur outside of our conscious awareness or control. They affect our opinions and behavior. This is something that um, we don't realize we have, but they're there. Um, and then something to look out for is confirmation bias, the selection collection of evidence. It's our subconscious tendency to seek and interpret information as a way to affirm our existing beliefs, ideas, and expectations or hypotheses. And, you know, reporters have these biases. Um, you know, they select objective facts, but they may, and they try to check their fact biases at the door of the reporting, but they still have that bias. You know, what stories does the organization choose to cover? They still have to be fair, even if they have these biases. That's why they try, have to have those comments, is because even if they are reporting in a way that might confirm what they believe or um, may provide an, an implicit bias, they still have to try to be as fair as possible. Give them the opportunity to speak. Um, 
you know, if you, you you know, you cannot write an article on the highlight uh, that highlights the dangers in the juvenile justice system and not, you know, which would be, um, you know, implied as critical of that system without at least interview request or um, uh, press releases or statements from spokespeople of the juvenile justice system. Um, but like I said, we're also biased in a way. We, we, you know, that's something to always be mindful of is that, you know, be careful if an article is something is is making you feel. Um, uh, if you're if you're not wanting to believe something, just because it's not confirming what you believe, you always want to be careful of that. So uh, let me wrap up with just some tips here. So I mentioned find the parent company of the news organizations and or their editorial policies. You know, how do they accept advertising? You always want to ask, is this story so outrageous you can't believe it? If it if it's so outrageous you can't believe it, then, you know, it may not be the most um, uh, truthful. It, you know, it, consider that a red flag. It's so outrageous you can't believe it. You know, Trump's building a tower in Pyongyang. Um, is the story so outrageous you do believe it? Be careful of that, too. Like I said, there are some people who believe that Trump was building a tower in Pyongyang because of their own political biases. So, like I said, let me, you know, the quotes I've already, you know, mentioned that I always, you know, that I think are really wise, good journalism provokes feelings, bad journalism exploits them. And you don't want to believe everything you see or read. But you also don't want to uncritically disbelieve everything. That's just as bad. So some other tips for engagement with the news you know, check multiple outlets. You know, if you see a story that seems unbelievable or seems big and is kind of shocking to you, like if it gives you an emotional reaction, check other news sort, check other news outlets to make sure that other news outlets are covering it. Like I said, if the president of the United States says a UFO is flying over um, uh, Georgia, you 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 want to make sure that that quote was correct. That other news outlets are reporting that. Um. Check for sourced and linked documentation and read the inform original information. If it's, I would especially do that for a big news story, but I, you know, you can do that with small news stories too. Make sure they're, you know, they're providing linked documentation. Make sure that they're at the very least describing their sources. Um, use factcheck.org. So factcheck.org. Go to factcheck.org. They're, they're, they're fairly straightforward about um, um, about things that are that are trending. They tend to cover big stuff. so, so be on the lookout for that. Am I using that source? Snopes is also a really good one. That's snopes.com. Those are all. That's also I would say a recommended I'm a, I'm a resource for finding, you know, sort of fact-checking information that tends to be trending, that tends to be too, you know, too outrageous. And like I said, don't believe everything, don't doubt everything. And I think an important one is use caution when sharing news or memes on social media. Before you share something that comes on your Facebook timeline or that's on your Twitter feed, make sure that it's right. Like, copy and paste the statement, put it in Google, See if there is a legitimate news source or a, a trusted news outlet um, attached to it. Um, make sure that it's, you know, be careful of sharing something that is um, uh, as reporting. Because like I said, you're acting as a news publisher for your friends and followers. If it's commentary, then, you know, then I would maybe add a statement that says, you know, that this is commentary or something to that effect. Guys, thank you so much for... Staying with me with this presentation, um, I have the script and handout that you can um, use with additional resources, um, some some other libraries that offer civic labs and news labs that you can use, um, some news the news literacy project, and some articles that I think would be um, uh, useful in, um, uh, in supplementary content for this presentation. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to email me, Bennett, B-E-N-N-E-T-T-M at thecablibrary.org. Um, Bennett M, as in Bennett Martin, Bennett M at thecablibrary.org. This is a presentation I created and I have to be accountable for it. But if you have any questions, let me know. Um, look look forward in the um, uh, fall for 
the um, uh, this program in person um, and with other programs in person from the Georgia State of Communications and um, uh, other individuals that will hopefully pro help you understand more about news resources. Have a great weekend and thank you so much.